Hello, and welcome to the October 9, 2021 edition of Diving Deeper Discussions. I'm your host, Randy Isaac, and on behalf of the American Scientific Affiliation, and we're dealing with uh, the current issue of perspectives on science and Christian faith. And we are delighted, it's time to have uh, Carol Hill with us. She's the author of the featured lead article. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss that shortly. And also George Murphy is with us and uh, Roy Clauser will be with us as soon as we, zo- we resolve some echo issue with his system. So this will be uh, coming on soon as soon as they, they uh, uh, get that resolved. So uh, first of all, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce to you Carol Hill. She's really no stranger to most of you. Uh, Carol's an ASA fellow and has been an ASA member for 38 years. So she's been with us and, and the, many of you have, may have met her and, or talked with her a little bit. So she has the lead article in the journal, which is titled Original Sin with Respect to Science, Origins, Historicity of Genesis and Traditional Church Views. That's a huge topic. So we look forward to getting into that. Carol, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to see you all. I see a bunch of faces I know here, Ralph and Louise and other people, but uh, that's great. So looks hello like again it's, to all of you. Looks like it's bright and sunny out you where you are. You're, you're in the Albuquerque Yes, now region, we've got right? too much sun. The last time I was in a meeting, it was so dark because we had all the smoke coming down from the Sierra Nevadas. Oh, and it, yes. Smoggy. It's all dark Smoggy. here now. Right. <laughs> okay. So uh, before we get into the content of your article, let, let's, uh, uh, not everyone here uh, knows you that well. So uh, let's just share with them a little bit of your, your background and who you are. Did you, um, were you born and raised in Albuquerque or where, where did you start your life? Oh, I was born in Detroit, Michigan, mm-hmm. and I was raised in San Diego, California. Then I moved to, I started college at the University of Berkeley in California. Then I went to to Michigan and finally finished up at the University of New Mexico. Mm, That's um, great. And what was your, your major, what was your field back then? My field is geology. Mm -hmm. And I started to become a geologist um, through the sport of caving or some people call mm-hmm. it spelunking. And uh, at that time, my husband, Alan, and I, we were at the University of Michigan and started caving in the Mammoth Cave system in Kentucky. Well, mm-hmm. I got so interested in caves that I started to take geology courses at the University of Michigan. And then when we moved to Albuquerque, um, I started at, uh my graduate studies at the University of New Mexico. And mm-hmm. during that time, I started doing my research in the, on the geology of Carlsbad Caverns in the caves of the Guadalupe Mountain. And that's the time I wrote my book uh, for the New Mexico Bureau of Mines on um, the uh, geology of Carlsbad Caverns. And then finally, about 20 years or so ago, uh, I started working in the caves of the Grand Canyon, high in the walls of the Red Wall limestone. Mm. And that we, we've, uh, we've, I was also, we kind of changed from the caves to um, the origin of the whole Grand Canyon, because it turns out the caves gave us a lot of idea of how old the Grand Canyon was. So um, then just about five years ago, in fact, it's been exactly five years, um, I was the senior author of our book, Grand Canyon Monument to an Ancient Earth, uh, along with, I see Ralph Sterley here, and uh, probably others are coming in. Uh, but anyway, we had, I was a senior author, but we had 10 other geologists, paleontologists, and one biologist wrote that book. 
Yeah, I think that book was featured at one of our ASA annual meetings, if I recall. Yeah, uh, uh, they haven't the great... decided the date yet, but all of us, all 11 of us are going to try to be at that meeting. Which meeting is that? Well, uh, Ralph, <laughs> which meeting is it? I, I was saying it was about five years ago that, that you had the launching of the book that we were all there at the annual yeah. meeting. Yeah. Five years ago. That's why I said it's just been yeah. five years. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's great. So um, so you you've had a a focus on the geology of the Grand Canyon and and uh, how did you um, kind of veer into the topic that we have today? It's, it's incredibly broad. You cover you touch on so many things. How did you well, get into that topic? Right. Well, that's because the, the book, my book on um, the uh, worldview approach to, gra- to um, uh, science and scripture is very broad. So I had, from writing that book, I had a very broad perspective on mm-hmm. science and apologetics uh, mm-hmm. at that time. And what happened is after we finished the book, I thought to myself, after 20 years of trying to write this thing, that while I'm through with it, except Mm. in my mind, one thing, original sin, because all the things I have in the book, especially the anthropology and the archaeology, relate to uh, original sin and and Augustine's, uh, you know, uh, doctrine of of um, uh, original sin being mm-hmm. biologically transmitted. Mm-hmm. So I had the scientific background to address that present. Okay. But my colleagues George and Roy, um, they said. They were both reviewers for my worldview book, Uh, and they said, don't go into the theology, stick with the science. So, so, and I thought, that is great advice. And so uh, they provided any of the theology in that book uh, and that I had in that book. So now when uh, I uh, came to write this article, I said, hey, Roy, hey, George, how about the three of us writing articles in Perspectives in Science and Chris, uh, Christian Faith and giving them the three perspectives? <laughs> All right. So, so, that's, so that's why we're here we're sitting here right now. So we the, pri- the price it. the price they paid for reviewing your article is that you put them to work. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, I don't uh, know about that, but we need well, it. Well, that's great. You see, I'm not a theologian. Right. And so people ask me, well, what about Romans 12 yeah. or, or 512 or whatever? And I can okay. tell them what I think, but so that's it. <laughs> it's great that we have Roy and George with us. I think we have Roy. Uh, Vicki, did we get that straightened out with Roy? Is he yeah, Roy's uh, on. He's available? He's I'm He's told under to, Anita. Oh, yeah. Right here. All right. All right there we I went. Go. I went to my wife's laptop. That's the solution. Ah, oh, that was a solution. That's great. Right. OK, so, well, we, you know, while while we're talking a little bit, uh, we can rename you temporarily. How about that? Oh, well, I don't know okay. if I can, but somebody else may be able to. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, uh, Roy, it's a pleasure to have you with us here. And uh, uh, you are also an ASA fellow. You've been, I think, a member of ASA for about 31 years, if I recall. So uh, you uh, published a number of of articles around here. And uh, uh, (laughs) so as I understand it, you are or were uh, in New Jersey, professor of philosophy and religion. Is that right? Yes, I was. I'm, I'm retired. I've been retired now for almost 20 years, but I, I was at the College of New Jersey. And uh, for 18 of those years, I also taught at Rutgers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Rutgers. Excellent. Yeah. So if, if I understand Carol here correctly, it was uh, Jim Peterson, as editor, who roped you into reviewing our article, and that's how you got into this? Is that right. how it went? <laughs> that's- ah, so we have Jim to thank for that. 
Yes. Okay. All, All right. right. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, okay, we'll get into your, for those of you who, who haven't seen it, the title of his article is, is uh, uh, Three Theological Arguments in Support of Carol Hill's Reading of the Historicity of Genesis and Original Sin. So it's a, it's a very specific title. Yes. So we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute. But first of all, let me introduce George Murphy, who needs no introduction to this mm -hmm. uh, group. Hello, George. All right. Well, glad to be here. I'm out in, I'm not at home now. I'm in Southern Arizona and I don't know why the light lighting worked out this way. It's this kind of makeshift arrangement and looks as if I've been heavily sunburned, but that's not the case. <laughs> kind of in shadow. We'll take your word for it. Yeah. So uh, it sounds as if you, you got into this situation the same as Roy did. You reviewed the article and got asked for a, for a supplement, huh? Uh, yes, I, I would say though that I have written a number of things in, in my article in this this month's uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, there's a list of publications on this, but a number of things uh, on the subject, particularly of original sin and some of the related matters, uh, for quite a while. There's one in perspectives, I think, in 2006. Right. Okay. No, that's 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 great. And and as I understand it, that uh, all your work keeps you busy, even though I believe you've retired from uh, being a Lutheran pastor, right? Well, I'm I'm retired uh, as far as uh, well as far as the church's board of pensions is concerned, <laughs> but I continue to do some supply preaching. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I should have pointed out that uh, George is also an ASA fellow. All three of the authors are. George um, has been an ASA member for 43 years. So uh, the three of you together represent 112 years of <laughs> ASA membership, which is uh, um, highly credible. And we appreciate your support and membership all this time. So, all right. So, so now that we've got a very brief uh, perspective on who you all are, let's get into the content of things a little bit. So, um, Carol, you've got... Uh, really an, an, an incredible breadth here, what you're uh, focusing on. And I think what we'd like to do is, first of all, have uh, uh, some of the, a couple of submitted questions and then open it up for discussion here. So Vicki, if you wanna uh, uh, open it up so people are allowed to be unmuted. So we do recommend that you remain muted just to block off any unintended background noise, uh, but we will now permit you to be unmuted when you uh, need to be. Okay, are we all set, Vicki? Fantastic. Okay, so um, let's start with uh, uh, Del Kuhn was the first to submit a uh, uh, question here. And Del, I see you over there. Um, hello again, welcome. <laughs> the program so hello again um, i'm on i think yep you are go ahead okay thanks thanks Randy. and thanks for your three articles um i really wanted to acknowledge the idea that this isn't one of my questions i wanted to acknowledge the idea that what god breathed into adam was prophecy and not respiration but to my question i was kind of intrigued by the idea i agree with carol's placement of adam around, you know, 5,000, maybe a couple of thousand years earlier for the agriculture. I was kind of intrigued by the idea that Genesis presents clothing as an acknowledgement, Adam and Eve acknowledging that they've sinned, disobeyed God and fallen short. And yet, scientifically, we understand clothing came in around no later than 83,000 years ago, maybe up to 170,000. So I guess my question is, speculative can we do we can we say anything about the psychology of um, 100,000 year old humans as far as their understanding that they had fallen short of God and maybe in the context of when Genesis was written is there any Babylonian mythology about how close came about Oh. I'm, I'm signing off as soon as I can find my mouse. Yeah, that's okay. Who, uh, who wants to take that? Is that addressed to me? It's to I, any of I, you. 
I probably don't know the answer. The question we got from you of yesterday from Randy was something about clothing. And I said, I know nothing about that. I'll give that over to, to Roy. Um, all I can say uh, is the first homo sapiens are known to have uh, lived about 200,000 years ago. That may be up now. There's some evidence that, that it's even older. So it's very hard to understand uh, them except they were very primitive as far as technology goes, of course. And, um, and I do know from the archeological record that um, in Saudi Arabia, the, uh, the Southern part of Saudi Arabia, um, they have Doc Jeffrey Rose, who's been doing the archeology span there, has dated the first people in that area at, uh, at about 100,000 years. So that's about all I know, uh, you know, about the archaeology. And okay. um, I also, you know, it's very difficult to tell whether they recognize sin or whatever your question was. <laughs> uh, then really in the archaeological record, you have to get back to the Paleolithic, maybe the Mesolithic uh, to start fi finding ritual burials and um, uh, grave uh, fire, you know, the things that would say that, yes, they probably had some idea, some religious ideas at that time, but that's as far back as I know. Uh, Roy, do you have any comments? Yes, I'd like to comment on that. Yeah. Uh, the interpretation that uh, I've published in our journal in December 2016, follows a, an old Jewish interpretation. And it's, of course, it's notorious that how difficult it is to try to date when anything went into the Talmud. We don't know. It's just impossible to figure that out. But we do know that there's a very old interpretation. It is in the Talmud. It's commented on in the 13th century by Nachmanides, uh, the great Jewish commentator of the Middle Ages, and that understands Adam and Eve to be not the first humans, but the first humans to be offered redemption by God. And that means that there was a human race already on the planet. Uh, they were, by nature, uh, sinful, if you mean by that, they don't have the true God. There's two senses of sin, moral and religious. Were they aware of doing morally wrong things? I think it's it's a good bet they were. Did they were they aware of having the, the wrong God? Probably not. There was no revelation yet. Then with Adam and Eve, God makes himself known. And so they know very well when they break the command uh, that God gave them not to eat of that tree. So uh, in fact, it, it's important and significant that Paul, in his preaching, as that's recorded in the book of Acts, two times he says, in times past, God overlooked human sin, but now calls upon everyone to repent. He refers to a time when God didn't hold people responsible for it because he hadn't revealed himself. And, and he does it twice. And that's the understanding that, that this uh, old interpretation uh, takes of Adam and Eve. The first people to receive the covenant uh, are redemption. They broke it. Now there are covenants trying to restore the human beings into proper relation to God. So I, I don't know if that answers what you were after com completely, but. If I knew, I wouldn't have, if I knew, I wouldn't have asked, but I appreciate your insights. I don't know either. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. This interpretation you can find in a, a very wonderful little book by the uh, probably the most outstanding Orthodox rabbi in North America of the 20th century, Joseph Soloveitchik, and his little book called The Lonely Man of Faith, explains it very succinctly and, and beautifully. Sorry, George, go ahead. No, I, I just, I, I have no real, <clears throat> no expertise to offer. Uh, and uh, I think it may be clear from 
if you've read my article most recently or anything else, that uh, I have absolutely no investment in the idea of an historical Adam and Eve in the sense of the first humans that, you know, that everybody else had descended upon. Uh, but as far as, as the matter of clothing is concerned, my, my non-expert guess is that people started wearing clothing because A, it would keep them warm and perhaps B, would protect them from, you know, things in the environment. Uh, I doubt that it had any great moral or religious significance to begin with. Yeah. And, and I don't think Genesis suggests that. Um, as I read that story, what what strikes me is that the the authors go out of the way their way to say that the man and his wife were in the garden and were not ashamed. So when they give being ashamed as the reason for hiding from God, you know they're lying. And I think God gave them coverings to remind them of their lie. Uh, well, I, I mean, not, I, no, there's no suggestion that's the origin of clothing. My my understanding of again, and this is not not particularly expert, is they a, after this event they look at each other and they say, "Hey, she's naked. He's naked." And I mean, it's an awareness of of I mean that as you know from you as you go on in in the, the Hebrew scriptures that this concern of being clothed. I mean, you don't get naked in front of other people. And, you know, this whole awareness of, you know, problem there uh, is, is indicated by them being clothed. Yeah. But I, again, keep using the word non-expert, and as far as that's concerned, I am. So yeah. at least not the onset of clothing, right? Right. Okay. It's, I, I All think right. There's one other element there that's very interesting, and that is that I, I, I see uh, them in this, you know, caught like the deer in the headlights, they, they caught uh, in their sin. And now they begin to blame God. Well, we were hiding because of the way you made us. And then God says to the, uh, the man, did you eat of that trait? The woman you gave me told me to eat. Woman, did you eat of that? The snake you made told me that yeah, they keep trying to put it on God. Mm -hmm. Instead of taking okay. responsibility, right? Okay, good. Uh, let's let's move on then. Um, another question was submitted from Dick Fisher. Dick, I see you're on, but you indicated in the note to me that your microphone isn't working, and you can't say it out loud. Is that still the case? Um, I don't hear anything from you, so I will read your question which you say is a question for Carol. Do you see any significance in the biblical names of any of Adam's immediate descendants that would tie them to Mesopotamian history? Carol? Well, the, the information that I have on that actually comes uh, from you, Dick. And I, I have it in my book, and I just want to uh, uh, read a little bit of what uh, I have a view. This is from your historical Genesis from Adam to Abraham. And he's talking about the Mount of Eridu, which is probably one of the first um, cities or uh, te uh, temp uh, temples or whatever in Mesopotamia. And um, it says there that... Um, uh, uh, Dick Fisher presented his view that the Mound of Eridu could have actually been the altar of Adam. And he has uh, four names, Adapa, which is Adam in Babylonia, Adamu, Akkadian, Aluminum, Alum M in Sumerian, and, and Atom in Egyptian. I think this is very important, and that's why I have it in my book. Um, it's the significance is that all these names being so familiar supports the idea that Adam and Eve were real people uh, and that Genesis is a historical document 
probably over the whole region. Now, that doesn't mean that they could have got like Egypt could have got the stories from Mesopotamia and then changed it into their their own words. So um, it suggests that Adam and Eve were historical people, but it doesn't uh, prove it. And I don't know, I can't see where uh, where Dick is. You said you saw yeah. him? Well, his name is on there. He's, he, he does, can't okay. just uh, share the video or the audio. But, but uh, that's what he can probably hear you. What, uh, we're yeah. trying, all three of us are trying right. to say that Adam and Eve, uh, well, uh, maybe George doesn't agree. They were, they were historical people. No, no, I, I, I do not think, I, I do not think, first of all, that we are all descended from a single no. couple, which is, which is the traditional understanding of historical Adam and Eve. Secondly, I mean, I, you know, I can't say 100% certainty, but no, I don't think the tra early chapters of Genesis are, <clears throat> are, are uh, focusing on a particular couple who existed several thousand years ago. That's, I think that the picture of Adam and Eve uh, that we have in Genesis is a representation of the earliest humans that the, the uh, writers of Genesis and the traditions that they come from were aware of. But no, I simply don't think there was an historical Adam and Eve in that sense. The, the genetics indicates that the, uh, the uh, minimum pot, uh, uh, bottleneck population for the present day humans is several thousand people at least. And so, you know, if, uh, the, the uh, pictures of Adam and Eve that we have may in some sense reflect people from that bottleneck period uh, but that's a very different thing from saying there actually were two couples, Adam and Eve, in the same sense that there was George and Martha Washington. Well, that, that's the problem. But then you've got really two problems here. One is tracing Homo sapiens back, and you cover that, George, in your, uh, your dual uh, system. But that doesn't mean that Adam and Eve, see, Adam and Eve don't, now they're going back to 200,000 years or so. Uh, but that doesn't mean there couldn't have been an Adam and Eve the 5,000 years ago that the Bible is talking about. And I think Roy and I would say that they're the first people in, in the redeemed line of humans. I, that's a, well. I, I don't think that that it provides a helpful, okay, and let me say something, if I may, about my article, my relatively brief article in Perspectives. Uh, <clears throat> I, the, too often when we talk about this whole business about original sin, we focus entirely on how did it originate historically. That is only one part of the traditional understanding of original sin. Original sin originating and really the most important part is what that means for us today. Original sin originated. And particularly as a pa parish pastor uh, and, and as a <coughs> theologian, that's what I'm primarily concerned with. <coughs> and it's part that, I, that, that pastors and theologians have to address today. And so the, the whole question of, of you know, whether it descended from a historical Adam and Eve is really a kind of secondary issue. So the idea that original sin depends on there being an historical Adam and Eve, it just doesn't. Pelagius and Augustine both made that mistake, but it, it is a mistake. We have a situation where people start out their lives in a, uh, a state of separation from God. As I mentioned in my article, I, I saw a statement by an atheist several years ago, uh, babies are born 100% atheist. Yeah, that's exactly the issue. Babies don't start out believing in the one true God. We don't do that. We are, the, the, the human race is 
in that sense, starts out in that state of separation from God. And the whole point of what God does, starting with Abraham, uh, is that trying to pull people back to the right relationship with God. So far, the words of my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, that's great. All right. Mm-hmm. So um, let me just, just um, make a comment about questions. If you uh, would like to ask a question, participate in the discussion, please go to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and click on raise hand. And I will call on you in the order in which you raise your hand so we can have a, uh, an orderly discussion here. So um, rather than putting it in the chat, I'm not going to read the, the chat box. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, then, then raise your hand and, and do that. But before we get to that, uh, there was one more submitted question that uh, came in at 2 p.m. So it uh, didn't uh, register to any of us. Uh, Joe Lechner. So I'll just take that as a, a request to ask a question. So I'll just let you share your question right now, Joe. Thanks, Randy. Uh, I could ask it in a couple of ways. Uh, from an archaeological point of view, how can we possibly know whether someone dead and gone was a sinner? Uh, alternately, uh, Carol, do you find uh, archaeological evidence of conscience, such as sacrificial altars, going back to, uh, let's say, 200,000 years before now? Well, there have been uh, altars discovered that have been dated as old as 25,000 years ago. Um, and right now, there's a big excavation going on at uh, Gobekli Tepe in southern Turkey that has uncovered what appears to be a temple. It's a, an, a, an amazing discovery, and it's been dated at about 12,500 years ago. So that certainly, people were on the earth, and they were religious prior to Adam and Eve. They didn't have the true God, but they had... Religion, they had false gods. And I think that, that was what Paul was referring to in his two sermons recorded in Acts, when he says in times past, God overlooked human sin. That's what he says in Romans 5 about Adam. He says, he starts to make a parallel between Adam and Christ. And he interrupts himself and says, of course, sin was really already in the world. But God didn't hold it against them because there had been no law. No revelation from God. That's what Romans 5.12 says. So if God holds, holds people responsible, once he's given a revelation of himself and he's given law, he's given a command. And so Adam's the first to receive God's revelation, the first to be the object of redemption, and the first to disobey God's command. Uh, Joel, um I think uh, you're asking about the archaeological record. I was referring to the anthropological record where it looks like there was some sort of animism, um, you know, ritual bur- burials and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, that probably only goes back, um, you know, to the, the paleo. Uh, not Paleozoic, that's geology, Paleolithic age where there's some ideas. So probably for maybe at least 50,000 years or so, there's some evidence for um, these, I don't know about sinful nature, but about people having religious ideas. Of course, the, the, the great caves in France and so forth, um, they go back about 35, 37,000 years. So that's all I know of in, in the record that would give us an idea of when people really starting to ha- started to have a concept of, um, 
of a god or afterlife or religious feelings. Does that answer your question? Well, it sounds like you are equating the burial of the dead with religiosity. Well, yeah, that's, we can't know. We can't know when it came in. But I would say probably by 40,000 years or so, uh, people had probably from cave paintings and stuff like that, that they probably had some concept of, of religion. But you never know that, of course. It's not burial of the dead so much as it is what appear to be altars. Yeah, uh, altars. Yeah. And, that, and they're pretty old. Because, yeah. I, unfortunately, I can't think of the title of the book, but it's a book by a primatologist, Barbara King, uh, based on, on religion and talking about some sense, and we wouldn't call it religion, you know, it's not, not religion in any sort of modern sense that we think of. But some idea of some, you know, sense of the other uh, uh, among even even apes, present day apes, uh, that that there's some awareness, some sense of awe, some puzzlement of what death means, things like that. Uh, so you know, if we're talking about religion in a very broad sense, I don't, you know, it probably goes pretty far back. Now I've used the term. Uh, you know, you, you, we use the term often, this idea of, of uh, anatomically modern humans. Uh, I've used the term anatomically religious, uh, not, I'm sorry, uh, religiously modern humans in the, in the sense that there's something resembling modern day human religions uh, there. And exactly when that begins is, you know, it's not that easy to pinpoint because uh, you see it pretty far back. Yeah. You could turn it around and put it another way. I'm agreeing with you. This is another slant. You have humans when you have people that have religious consciousness. In Genesis' view of a human, see, a human is, isn't an anatomical definition. It's a being created in the image of God for fellowship with God. When you have someone with the, that capability, then you have a human. So a lot of this depends on our idea of what does it mean to be human. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we've got a raised hand here from Peter Corfield. Hello, Peter. Good to have you with us. Hello, Randy. Hello, guys. Yeah. Um, Carol and Roy, I was fascinated with the two articles you wrote. Uh, I don't usually read perspectives, but I read those. And fascinated with the idea of a historical Adam and Eve, which theologically makes sense to me anyway, but um, I haven't figured out how it could happen. Are you saying that everybody today is linearly descended from Adam? So we can we trace back, I can trace my family back to 1300. That, I didn't hear that. Say it again, the question. Everyone, can everyone trace their heritage all the way back to Adam? Everyone today? No. No, we held the view that Adam and Eve are the first people to be stand in redemptive relation to God, the first people that he called to redeem, but they were not the first human beings. Well, I know but you're saying that. Wait, wait, wait. And not everybody defining human as someone who has got that holy the spirit of God that was breathed in, Genesis 2 7. Uh, <clears throat> are we human in that sense? if we're not linearly descended from Adam? I'm just asking. This is a, a key verse, in my opinion, to the whole story. And so if you'll indulge me, I'd like to tell you what that old Jewish interpretation says about this verse. Mm -hmm. It says, God, now I'll repeat the verse the way it usually occurs in English. The Lord God created man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. That's the, that's the verse we're talking about. Uh, in the first place, 
God having created people of the dust of the earth refers to their mortality. That is an expression that everywhere in the Old Testament is associated with mortality. So it says God had created human beings mortal and now breathed into them. And then we would expect to find, if, we're, if it's talking about an, a human, an anthropology of humans, we would expect to find they breathed into them their soul or their spirit. Soul is nefesh, spirit is ruach, but it doesn't use either of those terms. Instead, it uses the term that is most often used for God putting his spirit into a prophet. So what happens here is God has created humans mortal, that is, the dust of the earth, now breathes into them his own redeeming spirit and gives them eternal life. He redeems Adam from death. That's what's going on in 2.7. It's not a creation account. It's a redemption account. And in John 20, 22, Jesus reenacts it. Have his post-resurrection appearance with his disciples, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. That's what's going on in 2.7. He is not making Adam a human. He is not putting into him the breath of metabolism. He's giving him his spirit and redeeming him from death. And that's why uh, Augustine's biological transmission of sin, to me, does not make any sense. He's talking about spiritual redemption. He's not talking about biology. But, of course... Augustine didn't know anything about all the things that we know about today about modern science, and that's what made sense to him from what he knew. I think mm -hmm. does that does that help, Peter? Mm -hmm. Or are you still no? <laughs> uh, well, ask it again. We'll try to. <laughs> In fact, Carol, it's it's worse than that. Augustine used a translation, a Latin translation of Romans, that was poorly done. I'm not asking about Augustine. Oh, well, that's where the idea comes from, that we're dealing with the first people and they, that all people inherited sinfulness from them. Oh. See, that, it's, that's, a, that's Augustine's influence. And he, he, his translation of Romans 5 had in it the, this, this line, it said... It talked about Adam, and then it said uh, that all men now are under the curse of death because in, in whom all men sin, referring back to Adam. And the Greek says, because all men sin, it doesn't say in whom. And he thought that by that, that he was bound to hold that all men has shared Adam's sin. I understand that. Uh, and it was, it was tragic. Uh, Peter, uh, what is it that you don't want well, to know? I, heard you don't say, understand. I, I thought it was lovely. You said that a human being is someone with a spiritual consciousness. Yes. Yeah. And that's what God breathed into Adam. And I love that concept. Now, do you mean that his descendants, because of the fall, didn't have that? So we're all back to square one? Is that what you're saying? No. Or do his descendants have that spirit of life. And what about us English guys who maybe can't trace our way back to Adam? I think I probably could, but, you know. Well, the, the inter this interpretation doesn't identify what God breathed into Adam with his religious consciousness. But human beings are by nature religious beings. They oh. may not be born, they may be born atheists, but they're not born with no religion. So you're saying that 200,000 years ago, they were living souls? Sure. Oh, okay. But what happens in Genesis 2-7 is God giving his spirit and redeeming the first person to be redeemed. Thank you. Okay. Does that help Thank you? <laughs> All right, Leah, let's move on. Um, we've got two hands up. Cy Gard is next and then Steve. So Cy, good to see you here. Thanks. Um, I, yeah, I'm just commenting on the last question. Uh, Roy, everything you said is great. 
I, I think it's terrific. I love your article, Carol, same thing. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's what Peter was asking. And, and Peter, you could correct me if I'm wrong. What I heard you ask was, are we all descended from Adam? And the answer to that is yes, because we are all descended from everyone who had who lived at that period of time, thanks to pedigree collapse. And this has been discussed at great length by Josh Swamidas in his book, The Genealogical uh, Adam and Eve, where he talks about why it is scientifically true that we are descended from everyone who was alive at the time that Adam and Eve were alive. So we're all descended from Adam and Eve and from everyone else who was alive then, whatever their names were. Now, that says nothing about the theology that Roy was talking about. And I think that that's, you know, that's a, that's a, a wonderful answer and a wonderful concept, but it doesn't apply to, to that biological question, which is what I'm answering. Well, and if I may comment on that, uh, we... Uh, to say that we are all descended from Adam and Eve assumes that there really was one historical couple who is being referred to in, gen in uh, the early chapters of Genesis. But, but not only one historical couple. No, no, no. In other well, words, if I mean, Adam and Eve were one of several couples, then we are descended from them as we are from all the others. Okay, but then that makes the whole significance of I mean, it really raises questions about the whole significance of the idea of our descent from. I agree, George. I mean, I, I actually, my own view is that it doesn't matter because, as I think Roy said, uh, you know, it, or maybe Peter said, we, we, we don't inherit by, oh, and actually Carol said, we don't inherit biological sin by, we don't inherit, inherit original sin biologically. There's no gene for sin. So, you know, uh, you're right that, you know, that's an issue, but I'm just saying that biologically speaking, if, if it's important that we're descended from Adam and Eve, one of the couples who were alive at that time, then the answer is yes, it, it, but it, I, I'm not sure that's important. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I think you agree what, with it. I've, I've had a lot of conversations with Joshua on this and he's convinced me that Adam and Eve, it's possible they could be the, uh, you know, at five, at five or 6,000 years could be the ancestors of everyone, but I don't think it's very likely. Um, I think uh, we've been over uh, the migration to Australia, up around to South America and all this stuff. But it seems to me there would still be some isolation, isolated uh, people groups somewhere uh, on the planet Earth. And, and furthermore, I don't think it's important because I don't think uh, that uh, Augustine's um, uh, biological idea was right in the first place. I think it's all a spiritual matter. So why get hung up on trying to put everybody to one couple? It's just to please Augustine, essentially. Uh, and, and I don't think that his uh, theory uh, was right. Um, he was, after all, let's go back to the fifth century AD. What did he know about anything, any science at all? What we have to do today is continue on like we're doing here and other places. We have to um, continue on looking into uh, uh, semantics and uh, you know, history and all that kind of stuff, because um, I don't think Augustine had the foggiest idea. All he knew was what the church was teaching in the fifth century AD, and he was trying to make sense of it. Well, what Augustine was one of the primary teachers of the, of the time. And they, again, let me call attention to the fact that the really basic debate that got that whole thing started was not the question of 
historical Adam and Eve, because both Augustine and Pelagius agreed on that. The whole question is, can we be sinless by our own efforts? Can we live in complete accord with God's will without the grace that God gives us through the, the death and resurrection of Christ? That was really the fundamental issue there. And Augustine was saying, no, we can't. And Pelagius thought we could be fine, high, you know, uh, morally upstanding uh, people in God's sight without, uh, without that. I mean, that's, be, be aware that that's really what the issue was that got this whole thing started. So, yeah, Augustine was wrong about the historical thing. So was Pelagius. All right. We've got five raised hands uh, queued up, so trying to get to everybody here and anyone who else wants. Uh, Steve, let's hear from you. Uh, unmute yourself so we can hear you. <laughs> well, Steve, I can't unmute you. You have to do that yourself. Okay. okay. There we you. go. Much better. Thank you for these thoughts on foundational ideas. Um, in the context of these ideas, Jewish thought sometimes, uh, ancient Jewish thought on body, soul, and spirit, have oftentimes identified those three parts of us with the three bara events in Genesis chapter 1. I'd like to focus in on the soul, maybe from a more biological question. Uh, but to address the Jewish question, body, the first bra and the header of Genesis 1-1, and, and uh, God created the heavens and the earth material, which happened pretty much during the first three Genesis days. Soul, first nefesh, pops up in day five in uh, Genesis 1-20. And the spirit, a little bit unknown, but many of them attach that to neshama in, in the uh, Genesis 2, 7. Soul's always interested me biologically in that day five comes up with uh, uh, first animal families that had rudimentary central nervous systems, such as jellyfish, nadarians, so forth. And I thought, well, artists paint the soul with, with cloudy pictures. And it, could the soul, and you may not have thought of this, uh, just be our central nervous system? And the spirit is a higher central nervous system that communicates with God uh, or whatever is going on in the spirit. Has anybody ever thought about this at all? I think that's a theological question. Uh, as I said, I, I was allotted the science and I don't, of these three guys, I'm the person that did the science and so that seems to me it's in their category to answer. I'd, I'd like to offer something. It may not be exactly what you're after. You, you'll tell me if it's not. Thank you. In, in my senior year in seminary, I, for my big paper in my senior year, I did an investigation of the word, the words soul, spirit, and heart in the Hebrew text and the Greek of the New Testament. And I found that there is a remarkable uniformity. It's not perfect, but there's a remarkable uniformity about how those terms are used. The word soul is, this is what I found. The word soul is associated with bodily life. For the Bible writers, the soul is exactly what does die. It's the life of the body. You suggest it's close connection to the central nervous system. That fits perfectly there. Spirit is more often used for a person's personality. It has to do with the diversity that's true of an individual. Some people have a meek spirit. Some have an aggressive spirit. Some have a, a kind and loving spirit. Other people have a spirit of wisdom or a spirit of, it has to do with our talents and, and personality. And heart is most often used to mean the unity of it all, the, the self, the, the ultimate subjective pole of what makes us up, what we do, so that all the other things are rooted in the, 
in the human heart. That's it's a metaphor using the the bodily organ as a metaphor for the the unity of the of the whole person. I don't know if that helps. Doesn't help. Addresses <laughs> maybe good a good comment. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, identifying the soul with the bodily part. That uh, uh, gives me some encouragement. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, let's move on on that. Got a lot of people here. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let's go on to also I am. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I'd like to um, thank all the um, the presenters so far and ex and Carol. I really found the article interesting. It was really easy to um. To, to, to comprehend. Uh, first, I'd like to know if um, you, you, you had the opportunity, any one of you, to interact with the work of um, William Lynn, Lynn Creek on this issue. Um, you, you know, he recently published his book, um, In Quest of the Historical Adam, where he moved Adam a couple of thousand years um, behind. And he, uh, he claimed that Adam is... Homo, homo heidelbergensis, something like that, you know. Um, so, but he is for a historical Adam. So that just one question. Um, the second question is, um, I, I didn't find much explanation of the fall. Now, let's assume, yes, that Augustine was wrong with the concept of, of original sin. But what about, about, about the fall? Um, I didn't find much interaction. And um, Roy talked about the breath of life, meaning redeeming. If I'm going to take re that word redemption as a theological word, does that mean there was a fall and there was a redemption and there was another fall and there was a redemption in Christ? So I, 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 I really got confused there. But I just would want to know what about 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 the the fall? Was the world created in sin, and God brought Christ through um, the whole um, evolutionary creation? So that's um, my question. I hope it was clear. Think that's for the theologians again, <laughs> uh, Roy and George. I well, I, I have the same question about uh, about the what uh, Roy has presented. I mean, to say that that the account of of the creation of Adam, particularly in in uh, uh, verse seven, chapter two, uh, is is redemptive. Redemptive from what? Death. He's what? redeemed from death. Yeah, yeah, but that's simply, that's simply not what redemption is. The is the whole picture of redemption in Christian theology. Redemption has, gener and when you talk about the redeeming work of Christ, we're talking about being, being bought back from this state of alienation from God. So as to overcome... And death, is, death is part of that, but death is not the whole thing. I mean, no, it's, it's, not, it's not the whole thing, but it's the original point. And when you say in theology... You mean theology under Augustine's influence. Eastern Orthodox theology sees the, the redemption of Christ as mainly the defeat of death and the, um, and the rescue of all humankind to immortal life with God. The sin intervened and spoiled that redemption, and the subsequent covenants had to over, give us a way to overcome and nullify that sin in order to be restored to the, the uh, relationship with God that would eliminate and overcome and defeat death. But that, in short, is the orthodox theology. And I in think orthodox, it's right. You mean Jewish orthodox theology? No, I'm so Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Oh, okay. Uh, right. yeah. I, I question that. I, I find it um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, we'll have to send you guys off to write more articles. Hey, Jim, you got yep. something to pursue here. Uh, <laughs> before we go on to Janet, I'd like to uh, 
exercise my prerogative here and and say a, f- uh, a little bit about original sin. Mainly, uh, there's a long history of discussion of original sin in the journal of the ASA. I was a little surprised that none of the three authors here uh, referenced some of those articles, particularly my favorite uh, historical uh, publication on original sin in the journal is Richard Bube's article, and I'll bet many of you remember that. It was in December of 1975, and I'm going to ask Vicki uh, if she could paste that in the chat if you're over there so that you've got the reference and, and the link to it, make it a little easier for you. But uh, Richard Bube titled that article, Original Sin as Natural Evil, uh, whatever that means. Okay, And uh, it's a very thoughtful, provocative article. I can't tell you exactly what he's saying, but that uh, publication actually involves a dialogue and responses from Bernard Ram and uh, Alvin Plantinga and a few others, and uh, uh, Bube responds to them. So it's an interesting one. Uh, I'm not saying there are answers, but what I'm saying is that as part of the entire dialogue here, uh, that's an ongoing, I, I think that's a valuable contribution and, and what we're talking about here. Uh, so I encourage any of you who are more interested in, in, in this topic that uh, uh, that's an excellent resource. And maybe if some of you are familiar with that, if, if anybody's able to concisely articulate just what Dick Bube is saying, that would be helpful. Uh, all right. So um, let's go on to Janet then. Janet? Hi, thanks. And thanks, everyone, for your articles. Um, Carol, I especially appreciated your summary in, in Table 1. So two two quick questions. First, um, uh, I guess for everybody, um, when you talk about the worldview approach, um, it, yeah, it does, it is, it is appealing and it seems compatible uh, with Scripture. But I do wonder what you do with such the distinction, you know, what the biblical scholars usually refer to the Genesis 1 to 11 primeval history and then the, the, the abrupt change in genre in, in Genesis 12. So I'm wondering how you would reconcile that with your worldview approach. Say that, the question again. The difference in genre, the genre of Genesis changes from Genesis 1 to 11 to, and Genesis 12 onwards. Um, well, I had, haven't really thought of it, except that you're changing the, the authors uh, in t- over time. Like Genesis 1, as I bring out in my worldview book, I do not take the days as uh, 24-hour days. I don't take them as long period of times, they do not correlate with geology at all. I take the uh, framework view that you have to understand the, the Meso- early Mesopotamians use of the number seven, that all of the seven days are the like uh, um, one and four and two and five or whatever, that's called the framework view, and it makes sense because they were writing from their worldview, their literary worldview. That's how they wrote back there. Now, when you get to, to Genesis 11 and so forth, you've got a whole different framework that's set up. You're not Mesopotamia anymore. I mean, you have, that's my whole point uh, on worldview. You have you have to understand the mindset of the people that are writing the text when they're writing. So uh, I think the genre changes. I mean, when you get to the New Testament, it changes completely. But the first, like, I would say past Noah, so forth there, really one, uh, that's one 
worldview that's from early Mesopotamia. Right, right. So that's not really what I'm, I'm talking about. <laughs> those, those issues are all would be in agreement with what most biblical scholars would say. And of course, also the context of ancient Near Eastern religions, which we haven't touched upon. Yes. Um, I mean, the purpose of, of a lot of the, the, particularly the Genesis 1 narrative is undermining the, the polytheistic religions that were surrounding. Um, but but I, I'm talking specifically about the, the change to it's generally agreed that it becomes more historical, it's mythopoetic genre until Genesis 12 becomes historical. So that's the, the only concern I would have with the world. Um, I, I, would, I would disagree with that in the sense that I think all of the early Genesis 1 to 11 is historical in a sense. You have a historical base, but it's interwoven with the um, uh, world view of the people, like uh, 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 Roy was saying about, you know, how they essentially how they thought about things and how they conceive things. I mean, numbers is a perfect example. The numbers of Genesis, the early, you know, uh, patriarchs and so forth, 900 years, 600 years, that's just all part of the culture of early Mesopotamia. Uh, it, it's not, you can't consider those as real numbers. You had real numbers. No, you had anybody does. Numerological I, numbers. So I, I, I would agree with the, with the question that was asked. Uh, I mean, there's a common statement. My, my very conservative uh, father uh, would say uh, history begins with, a with Abraham. Uh, begins in, I mean, when you get to chapter 12, you, you immediately have the sense, and maybe this is not all accurate historical detail, but it sounds kind of like something that, you know, you're really hearing an account of something that might really be history. And you don't, you have people who sound like real people. And in the first cha 11 chapters of Genesis, you know, you really don't have, I mean, Noah, you don't, what does Noah ever say? You know, you don't get a sense. He's uh, just a that figure. that so has you know, nothing to do with him being a real person. If you read my article, I have here the, the uh, 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 lost Ubar in there and saying that, um, uh, this 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 lost city of Ubar, they were in the southern um, Saudi Arabia in the area where they used to, um, you know, trade frankincense very early. And they were trying to find the lost city of Ubar, which was a main city there that, of that 4000 BC trade route or whatever. And so... <laughs> This story, it, it's an amazing story, and I encourage you all to, to get this book. But they were, they were up, up by this Ubar, and these tribesmen came down from the um, mountains, and they had their hair all up in braids, and it was blue, and they smelled like frankincense. And the fellow said, we are the people of Ad. Well, who in the world was that? Well, the Muslims will tell you. Um, he, he was the great, great grandson of Noah. So just because Noah didn't speak, uh, he, he was still a, a real person because you've got generations, you've got people descended from him. And, and the Muslims, they know about the history of Arabia. They know who... That, that, that's, not, that's, not good. that's not the point. The right. point is when you simply read chapters, what, six through eight of Genesis, you know, you just thought this figure named Noah, but you ever really get the sense well, that you know who Noah is, what he is like. When yeah, you read but, the, when but you, George, when, George, when, George you know, with Adam when, and Eve and Noah, you, you, you have 
hundreds of years of being yeah, passed mean, down uh, orally. If I may summarize, I think I think some of the issue is whether we're starting from a biblical perspective or a scientific perspective, um, and that could spark a whole another discussion. <laughs> but but, but I, if I can move on to my second question, and I, in the second one, I'm going to have George and Roy interact. Um, so, George, you made the statement about uh, all, everybody's born an atheist. That is making an assumption that our faith is, uh, is only cognitive. Um, and as Roy notes in his, uh, his other book, <laughs> we can know God in many other ways. So, um, and, and I guess the other thing that, that intertwines is, is the, the, maybe the, the psychological predispositions uh, for original sin. I don't know if you want to interact with the existential anxiety thesis, et cetera, but I'll have you to dialogue. Well, well let, me, let me respond first, because I agree entirely that, that uh, more is involved in believing in God than simply an intellectual concept. And as I commented in my article, I mean, what, who is a newborn baby's God? Who do they put their trust in? Who do they fear, love, and trust above all things? It is their mother or father or their care, some caregiver. That's, that's the person they put their trust in. They're not putting their fundamental trust in God, the real God, the creator of the universe. I mean, that's, it is indeed a matter, fundamentally a matter of trust, not simply a matter of, of uh, uh, okay. uh, intellectual understanding. Okay. Hey. All right. Well, uh, did you, Roy? Did you want to say anything there? Otherwise, we should go on. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure what what was being asked of me to do. Here. <laughs> it's all right. You could just say amen, and then we can <laughs> go on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's go on. Peter, good to have you here. It's getting uh, late in the day for you out in the UK, isn't it? Uh, yes, um, thank you. Now, somebody said there's no gene for sin. I think there are lots of genes for sin, and they're the genes that make us selfish, greedy, aggressive, and all of that. And that sometime in history... God stepped in and raised one, two, or more people up spiritually and brought them into partnership with himself. I'm not, I wouldn't like to be clear about the um, exact historical details. I don't think we can really easily tell. But evil entered the world, and we've lost a lot of that. In other words, original sin is the flesh. The term original sin was introduced later on by people like Augustine. As far as I can see, the, the one New Testament term that corresponds to it is actually the flesh. And that's what we certainly all inherit. We have lost a spiritual inheritance because of the presence of evil in our race. Now, I don't know to what extent this actually agrees with the Carol has said. And so, Carol, what do you think? What do I think about people having genes for sin? Is no, I'm saying I, I identify original sin with the flesh, our inherited human nature. And yes. by the fact that we've lost the spiritual partnership with God, that makes us higher beings than that. You mean you think you've lost them now or just in, in general? Um, since prehistory or at least history. Yeah, I, I think that we uh, essentially have genes for sin or we inherit sin. Um, I think uh, I agree with George on that, that we inherit sin from way back when our ancestors, our 200,000 years ago ancestors, obviously they were, uh, didn't have a religious conscience like we do now. I think that this whole idea of religious con uh, uh, consciousness has to do uh, with the migration of humans around the world that you had um, 
and I have that in my article and also in my book that there that you had sin, uh, so to speak, but it really, really wasn't sin. I mean, it was just the natural a natural desire to do things. They had to survive and so forth. And so, but once you got this migration around the world, that over time, that the human, all the parts of the human race, whether they were in North America or Australia or whatever, had evolved to have a religious conscience. And that I think that's, this is just my own thought that um, that God entered Adam and Eve at a time when the whole human race was capable of religious conscience. Because you you say, uh, you know, why why did he wait till Adam and Eve to do that? I think that people in the in the um, uh, uh, over time, you had a religious con conscience that had emerged. And so everyone was ready to hear God's message and then the gospel. Is that probably not answering your question? Uh, but I'm, I'm trying to look at it through the evolution of human and the evolution of sin as it came along. I, if I'm, I, 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 I would, is it, who's talking here? <laughs> okay, I, I would do, I think there's a great deal of truth in what you're saying. Uh, we know from, from the behavior of, of other, uh, you know, our relatives, look at the behavior of chimps or gorillas and so forth. We see behaviors that we would consider sinful if they were committed by human beings. I think the earliest uh, humans to which God, you know, commun began, communicated some sense of God's will for them, they, they, the, those behaviors are not hardwired, okay? We don't have to be violent. We don't have to be sexually promiscuous. We don't have to steal, but we have very strong tendencies for those things. That is kind of part of our evolutionary history. And so when the first humans wherever and however many there were, were given some awareness of God's will for them, they could have gone long, they could have agreed, they could have fought off those instincts, but they didn't. That's why I, I you know, why I use that phrase that sin was, you know, we're not hardwired, but it was pretty much inevitable that eventually people would sin. They would start moving away from what God wanted them to be. And, and so that is original sin originating in a sense. I mean, as soon as they become aware of God's will for them, they decide to do something different. Yeah, I would, I would call that uh, in the fullness of evolutionary time. That, okay. If you... Yeah, that evolutionary time, finally, humans, they went around the world and so forth. They evolved enough forward where God said, okay, here's one advanced civilization or whatever, and we're going to start there and work through this one line and well, to I, the see, rest I, of I, the world. I, I, I don't know that that's necessary. I think, I mean, there may, this may have happened a number of times. Well, okay. Yeah. I, but I mean, so yeah. we can't trace that. But we're talking okay. about trace. Adam and Eve here right. and, and yeah, the but, Western but that, world. Uh, and, and okay. okay, so yeah, so, I think there's a disagreement as to whether um, what some of us have called religiosity is something that can evolve or whether it was a gift from God. And I'm pointing to my belief that it probably has to be a special gift from God to Adam and Eve you're talking about, or to what? Yeah, well, to Adam and Eve, I think, are symbolic um, people. We take these texts and we sort of see how what is really trying to be said, but now we've got to fit that into the, the scientific picture, but um, mm -hmm. that's a long discussion. Okay, so uh, we've got one more question from Kurt Wood, and then 
I would like to ask one question and then we'll need to cut it off at 3.30. So Kurt, what, you, what would you like to ask? Hi, yeah, um, just one quick point on, on I thank Roy, uh, Ray for your, your article. I thought that was very uh, useful. Seems to me in, in um, if Augustine was right about Romans 5.12, then the text would have read something different. You know, it would have said that um, uh, I'll die because all are descended from Adam. And he could have precisely gone there in that text and he doesn't. He, he goes to, I'll, you know, I'll die because I'll sin. So I, I think that really kind of corresponds with what you're saying. I don't really like this idea about religiosity just kind of being a, a gift from God. It seems like there's the um, anthropological evidence even for religiosity being a lot wider, you know, spread than that. But it seems to me that it's really the, it's, it's, it's this idea of accountability uh, of Adam that really is the key thing that distinguishes him from any other humans that may have lived before that he has been given this revelation from God. Now he's accountable to God. And, um, <clears throat> you know, like Paul's argument in, in Romans that Ray's talking about, it seems like that's really the source of, um, you know, what really differentiates that the Adamic line from all other people, but it's, it's really more about, you know, how much revelation you've received, what you're accountable to. And once you're accountable to that, then that changes everything. Uh, it makes relationship with God possible, whereas it would, wouldn't have been before. So I don't know what you think about that. But. Sounds right to me. <laughs> That's the shortest sentence I should, we've I had should add one thing, just a clarification, because it's, we've gone by it several times. Uh, in rejecting Augustine's interpretation of early Ge of Genesis, we also, I also reject the idea that people were originally holy, upright, innocent, and good. Augustine just jumped at that because the text says God sees his creation and it's good. He thinks that means everything is as good as it could possibly be, so humans weren't sinful. I don't think that's true at all, I, and, and I don't think it's the right way to read Genesis. Interesting thing is when you look at how the Jews themselves translated Genesis into Greek, when it comes to saying God is the, the world is good and what God looks at his creation and it's very good, they use the word kalos. They use the word that, we, that is commonly used to wish someone a good day. They do not use agathos, which means virtuous and upright, praiseworthy. They don't use that. That's not how they understood it at all. And so and the, the view that I'm sketching here that uh, rejects Augustine, human beings were created and they had re a religious impulse, but they had sinful ones. They had false gods. They did morally wrong things. And God at one point decided to redeem the entire race and began that process with the first the first couple to be enter into the redemptive relation were the Adam and Eve. I take them to be historical. George thinks not. Either way, we could agree on the human nature being innately religious in some sense, but then uh, unless that innate impulse is redeemed itself and straightened out and given the right object of faith, which is the true God who's created the universe, Without that, it's a curse on humans because they worship and serve something God made instead of the creator. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to make a couple of quick comments, and then I'd like to give each of our authors about 30 seconds or less to kind of have a closing comment. Uh, and Maybe I shouldn't be doing this, but I'll make a few comments and I'm afraid there isn't enough time for you to, to uh, argue with me. Uh, just reflecting on, on, on a little bit on each of you. Roy, you wrote in your second paragraph, the point of my support will not be concordist. Rather, the support I offer will show that the text of Genesis has little, if anything, to do with the scientific data explained by Hill. My comment question would be, I wonder if the text of Genesis has little, if anything, to do with the historical data explained by Hill. George, you wrote um, in your article, quote, there is little to be gained by continuing to insist on a historical Adam. Just wondering also, based on the conversation here, 
whether the same you would apply the same to there is little to be gained by continuing to insist on a historical interpretation of the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which then leads me to ask you, Carol, uh, you have clearly spent many years and a lot of effort in terms of correlating the the, the archeological, uh, paleontological kind of evidence, data, uh, historical data with the biblical text. Um, I'm not disagreeing with any of that, but my question is what is there to be gained? Uh, Why is there any uh, influence on the theological validity of our beliefs here, the Christianity, um, whether there is a historical correlation or there isn't. So I I know I haven't left enough time for any of you to comment, but I'll I'll leave that out there for further discussion (laughs) or, or thinking. And meanwhile, I wanted to close with each of you, um, just saying very briefly, what would you like to have all of the audience remember? There's one little snippet you want them to remember from what you wrote or our discussion or whatever. We'll start with George, then Roy, and we'll let Carol have the final word. George? Well, for mine, I think, I think it's very rather simple and rather obvious from, from the article that I wrote that the, uh, the significant, the original sin is significant for people today, even if you never start asking questions, how did that originate historically? Was there an historical Adam and Eve? It's the way human beings, it's a condition that human beings have to deal with today. Mm-hmm. Okay, excellent. Roy? Uh, I think the point is, uh, the main point is that we are far more under the thumb and influence of Augustine than we realize. Um, even some of us, uh, the comments made here today, when they get reject parts of his account, they're assuming that other parts are right. And um, unfortunately, there's, I think there's more wrong with it than we usually take it to be. Um, he, got, he had a, a bad translation of Romans that misled him, and then he made a lot of other assumptions uh, that are not in the text. For example, that Adam and Eve are the first humans. It seems to me that early Genesis goes out of its way not to say that. And then it tells us a whole bunch of other things about them and their children and what their children did that, that couldn't possibly be said if the, they were the only four people on earth. Okay. Carol, you get okay. the final word. Since my uh, article was on the uh, science, I'm just going to mention three things here that I think I would want people to remember about my article. Uh, The first is the anthropological and DNA evidence preclude Adam and Eve from being the parents of the entire human race. They were not an aboriginal pair of homo sapiens living 200,000 years ago. And the people that think that are trying to uh, correlate uh, Augustine's biological theory with the uh, of of the Bible with the science, and I don't think it can be done. Second, Adam and Eve were the first parents, I believe, in the genealogical line of the Old Testament that led to Christ in the New Testament. That is, the Old Testament is Jewish covenantal history, not human history. And people get all mixed up over that. Third, the archaeological and biblical evidence place Adam and Eve in the Neolithic, Calcolithic, 6,000 to 5,000 BC, and not before. You can't uh, do what people have done, the young earth creationist or the progression creationist. You have to go combine the biblical and archaeological evidence, um, uh, and then you get the right perspective, then you're able to proceed from there theologically. Okay. At least that's the case for me. So, Okay. I, Thank yeah. you very much, Carol. I think there are uh, 
probably a spectrum of opinions here, which is great. This is you stimulate a lot of dialogue and uh, I encourage all of you to continue these kind of con conversations in another forum. Uh, we've spent an hour and a half here and, and uh, then we let people uh, continue. So I, I uh, would urge you to tune in on our next program on November 13th on the mystery of, of life's origins. And finally, I would like to once again thank uh, you, Carol, Roy, and George, for joining us. Thank you for your articles. And uh, with that, I'd like to say farewell. Well.